Hare Krishna. So today morning we are continuing this discussion on the understanding of the unborn child in the womb. And in yesterday's verse, it was said that the soul is surrendering to the Lord because of being in great distress. And then the contrast between the Lord and the soul is being brought about over here. Yesterday I talked about how can the soul, how can the child, who is the embryo with an undeveloped brain, speak prayers? And we discussed how the soul is not limited uh, to the body. The soul's consciousness can channel through the mind directly. And that's why there are some paranormal experiences that we do see in observe reality. So the child is offering the, the, the embryo, the soul as the embryo is offering the prayer to the Lord. And in this verse, it is said how the soul is bound in a material body, but the Lord is liberated. So the question may come up here that, okay, how does the soul know about God? We have different kinds of knowledge. There is some knowledge which we could say more or less is uh, superficial. It's like, okay, what is the capital of this country? Or when was this person born? Or what is the size of this building? So these are just, this is just informational knowledge. And some people have the capacity to put in, memorize a lot of facts. Some people may not. But beyond informational knowledge is functional knowledge. Say, for example, the capacity for language. Now, machine learning is being attempted, artificial intelligence is being attempted. And scientists are discovering how incredibly difficult it is to actually make intelligent speech or to even comprehend intelligent speech. A little bit of, uh, with huge amount of the best brains in the world programming together, robots can do a little bit conversation. It's very, very difficult. The point is that language is not just something which is learned from outside. We, you, the soul in the human body is given the potential to learn language, to communicate. And the same applies even to God consciousness. Prabhupada gives the example in the Nectar of Devotion that the so that parents may teach a child to walk, and the child may fall, and the parents may again the mother catches the hand, raises the father encourages, and they walk holding the finger, they without holding the finger, they be toddling a little bit, and then learning to walk steadily. Now the parents do play a very significant role in that, but still that doesn't mean that the parents are literally teaching the child from zero. The potentiality is there. If potentiality would not be there, then no learning would be possible. So the idea of potentiality here is that if we sow seeds in a barren land, no matter how good the seeds, no matter how good the agriculture, uh, the protection, the flowing, the fertilizers, the land, the, the seeds won't fructify. So we could say the land has to have the potentiality for the fructification of the seeds. So similarly, every soul has a potential for God consciousness. So Prabhupada often quotes this verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrit for this purpose. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Sathyanka Gunai Shravana Vishuddha Chitte Karaya Rudai So Nitya Siddha the Prabhupada translates this as this is eternally present. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Sathyanka Gunai But it is not so easily attained. It's very difficult to attain. But how is it? Shravanadi Shuddha Chitte. If we hear and speak, we practice the process of bhakti, then Shuddha Chitte, as the consciousness becomes uh, purified, Karaye Udai. Udai means it rises. 
so it's like the rising of the sun it is not that every morning somebody plans and creates the sun the sun is already there it just rises of its own accord so just as the sun is pre existing similarly love for krishna is also pre existing whenever we do any translation from one language to another there are many nuances which are lost in translation say for example uh we may say that you know this person uh speaks bad about me behind my back now if somebody wants to literally deconstruct this and somebody should they speak badly in front of your back you get the difference is behind your back and in front of your back functionally there is no difference the behind your back is behind your back if you may say this is not the time to make joke make jokes we want somebody to be serious and then they reply then what is the time to make jokes well that is not the point what happens there are certain uh, usages which are common in each language and if we try to translate some sentence which is which is say <coughs> more uh, idiomatic into another language often the nuances are lost so shri prabhupad when he translates the nitya siddha uh, he translates it as dormancy that love for krishna is dormant within our hearts and it is activated by the chanting of the holy by shravan and by hearing a chanting now there are many gaudiya gaudiya scholars in the gaudiya mand and other gaudiya groups who take strong objection to this understanding and they say love for krishna is not dormant in us love for krishna has to be actually awakened developed rather de- activated by the practice of krishna bhakti so of course associated with this is a lot of philosophical issues which i'll not go into but the essential point i'm going to make is that even when prabhupada uses the word dormancy so when we if we say something is dormant that means it is there already in its fullness but it's just not activated just like if dormant is more or less same as sleeping mm-hmm. if a person is sleeping then they might be a fully grown up person but they might be completely inactive and in one moment they wake up and they begin all their activities their intelligence their energy their ability all is there it's just inactive because they are dormant whereas when we talk about potentiality when you talk about potentiality it's not exactly the same as dormancy potentiality we could say is more equivalent to fertility rather than dormancy when when a land is fertile that means it has the potential for the for if seeds are sown for a tree to for fruits to come on that but it's not that the fruits are automatically present within the land within the soil so prabhupada uses the word dormancy but if we see the examples that he gives the examples he gives are always like the child learning to walk it's not that the child is already an adult who can walk there's potentiality the potentiality has to be carefully developed and of course prabhupada uses the same elaborates on the standard example of chaitanya charitamrita that there's a bhakti lata beej the seed is given by the guru krishna prasad in the bhakti lata beej by the mercy of guru krishna we get the seed of devotion and then the seed grows into a creeper and then it grows eventually to a um, to develop love to develop the fruit of love of god which can be relished eternally so um, the context of our discussion is not to get into that controversy but here the main point is that when we talk about dormant prabhupada is about dormancy it is more in the sense of potentiality and how is the child in the womb able to pray to pray to god that is because at one level the potential for no turning toward god for knowing god for loving god is there in in the soul the soul is intrinsically a part of god and that's why that potential is already always there 
Now that is, now we often say that what is the difference between humans and animals? What is the difference? What do you think? We can inquire about about God and the self. Yes, you can inquire about God and the self. That's true. Anything else? Animals can't. Art. Well, actually, some of the test, some of the nests that the birds make. There's a bower bird which actually makes magnificent nests as a part of its courtship dance. You know, to attract a mate, the nest it makes is far better than what a human being could make. So, yeah, inquiry, capacity for inquiry is true. Now, okay, let me specify this question a bit more. Where exactly is the difference between a soul in the human body and a soul in the animal body? The souls are essentially the same. The soul moves from one body to another body. So is the difference, the soul is not different, but then where is the difference? We have three levels of existence, the soul, the special body and there is the gross body. So the soul in the animal body and the soul in the human body is the same. So then where exactly is the difference? It's in the, it's in the evolve now, it's in the development of the evolution of the consciousness. So is this evolved consciousness a property of the soul itself? Yeah. 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 Is it a property of the soul? Yes and no, I would say. So, okay. Now if you consider the soul, what is the soul's relationship with the body? See, the soul is here, the mind is here, the body is here. Let's simplify things and we'll call subtle body by the simple word mind over here. So now the soul is covered over by the mind and the body. And at one level, even the soul's consciousness is very developed. The physical instrument also needs to be adapted enough to manifest that consciousness. Just like if somebody may be a very intelligent person, uh, they may be great artists, they may be, but if they they become blinded, their eyes are maybe having some disease because of which they can't see, then their artistic sensibility, their artistic capacity, their consciousness to create and perceive art and appreciate art will manifest. So definitely, there's a difference between the human body and the animal body, and, and in the sense that the human brain is much more developed. Our brains are much more complicated, far, far more complicated than our, if you want to use biological terminology, our nearest cousins in the animal species. <laughs> but so at one level, the inst that is different, that the brain is different. Then we could see the subtle body, which contains impressions. And the impressions that are present in each species are overall similar. It's not identical, but overall similar. Every human being is attracted to food suitable to human beings. And human beings are not attracted to food suitable for, say, hogs. We are repelled by it. So we could say that in human consciousness, there is a general set of impressions that are similar. Now, somebody might like pasta and somebody else might like pizza. That is an individual impression. But nobody likes food that is not suited for human beings. So again, the human consciousness is channeled based on the kind of mind that a person has. But, so the difference between the soul is, uh, between soul in the animal body and soul in the human body, at one level is that the instruments that they have are very different. The human body is a much more intellectually sophisticated instrument. The human body, along with the human body, they have a mind also, which is capable of asking fundamental questions. Now, beyond all this, it's in the soul itself, as you rightly said, the consciousness of the soul is more developed. And it's like that you can have different kinds of guns. 
Now some guns you just shoot one bullet. Some guns you can shoot maybe hundred rounds by that. Now suppose a gun which is maybe somebody has a cannon which you can shoot cannon balls at the opponent. Now suppose the guns which can shoot more, they are much more powerful instruments. But suppose they require also greater strength to operate. Now a small gun might be just you just pick up with one hand. But a big machine gun might require both hands to pick it up. A cannon you can't even pick it up unless you ride on the and then you operate it mechanically and lift it up and shoot it. So the instrument may be more sophisticated, but in this case, to use that instrument also, a person with greater strength and training may be required. So similarly, the difference between the soul in the human body and a soul in the animal body is not just in terms of the difference in the body and the mind. The soul's consciousness itself is more involved. And the more sophisticated body and mind give opportunity for that evolved consciousness to come through. Now to understand this, we could consider the soul in two ways. The soul is, I mentioned this, did I mention this yesterday about the soul is like a beam of light and the soul is like electrical energy? Last night. Last night, okay, on morning. Okay, thank you. That basically, the soul, we could say, is like a beam of light. It's like light is coming from this bulbs, chandelier, and that is the light of awareness. So you are looking at me. So from you, the soul, the light of awareness is coming to me. And that's how we have a, we use our Jnana Indriyas to acquire knowledge. But light only shows things. Light usually does not do many things. But if we have, say, electrical energy, electrical energy can cause a fan to move. It can cause even vehicles to move, cars to move. So electrical energy does things. So the soul interacts with the world, not only in terms of Jnana Indriyas, but also Karma Indriyas. It does things in the world. So this, we could say coming out from the soul is both like light energy, which perceives what is happening in the world and is also electrical energy which acts in the world and does things. Now these two are related based on what we see we act accordingly. But the point is the two broad ways in which the soul interacts with the world and the capacity to perceive and the capacity to act. These like how much you can have a flashlight which has maybe uh, a small light and some flashlights can have huge lights. So the soul, uh, you could say the some, some powerhouses give a little electricity, some powerhouses give a lot of electricity. So if the soul itself is more evolved in the human body, that means it gives out more light energy and it gives out more electrical energy. And Baldevi Dhyabhushan in the Vedanta Sutra says that these, at one level, the Bhagavad Gita, he analyzes this paradox. He says, at one level, the Bhagavad Gita says that avikaryoyam, chintyoyam, that the soul is unchangeable. Hmm? And then, yet we say that somebody is a degraded soul, somebody is an elevated soul. So, now what exactly is degraded or elevated about the soul? Now, it's not necessary that the soul is a degraded region in the world, in the hellish planets. Sometimes, souls in higher planets may also be degraded times. So he says that the soul, we could say, if we consider a powerhouse, the soul itself is unchangeable. But the soul's consciousness, the consciousness coming from it is changeable. So the soul is never degraded, but the soul's consciousness it is degraded. Now what do we mean by degraded? It's like each of us, when we come to a particular place, if you are very hungry, as soon as we enter the room, the first thing we'll see, where is the kitchen, where is the food? If you are eager to say, watch a sports match, where is the TV? I want to turn on the TV and watch this match. If you are very tired, okay, where is a where is a bed? I just want to, where is a couch or a bed? I want to relax, I want to rest. So the, the, our, the our consciousness goes toward the things that we are most interested in, that we are most desirous of. And when somebody is elevated in elevated consciousness, their consciousness goes toward elevated realities. When somebody is a degraded consciousness, their consciousness naturally goes toward degraded things. 
So, in all this, why am I discussing? We are discussing this point. Or how can the soul in the womb pray to God? We talk about how can you pray. So that's what we discussed yesterday. But how pray to God specifically? Is knowledge of God there in everyone? That's what we are discussing. And yes, it is. Because everyone has a potential. But this potential needs to be developed. So now, is this potential there in animals? Well, at one level, yes. The potential is also there in animals because their soul is also similar to our souls. But it is that the it's the battery, the powerhouse is emitting very less light and very less electrical energy. And that's why they can do a limited gamut of actions. And they can do a, have a limited gamut of perceptions. So there is whatever extensive studies of animals, ethologists have done, ethologists are scientists who study animals in their natural habitat. Uh, they have not found any evidence that indicate that animals ever ask fundamental questions about life. So when we, what are the fundamental questions about life? That means there's a question of how to survive and another question of why to exist or why do we exist? So how to survive, how to exist, these are questions which all living beings ask constantly and we human beings also ask them. So these are important, but these are functional questions. So even if somebody doesn't think about God directly, but what is the purpose of existence? That question is something which is fundamental. And only humans have this capacity to ask the question. And when do we ask this question? We all have certain purposes uh, which may be of little or more value, less or more value, which have been set up for us. Either society has set up those purposes for us, or we also, by our own imitation of what is being done in society, have set up purposes. Say, for example, uh, most of us, when we are born, we are told that, okay, you grow up now, you get education, then you get a career, then you have family, then you settle down with life. That is more like the pathway that is that is given for people. And some of us may have, okay, within the career, I want to become engineer, I want to become this, I want to become that. So we all set up our own goals in life and we start pursuing. So, so when does one really think about the ultimate purpose of life? That's broadly in two situations. When whatever purpose we had set seems unachievable and it's very frustrating because of that. We feel very frustrated, disappointed, disheartened. What we deeply, what we craved for, it's just taken away from us. It's just not there for us. And the other is when whatever is presented before us to be pursued is considered, we don't find it worth it. We feel it is pointless. So it's only when the purposes that are set up for us, we, they somehow lose their appeal. Either they lose their appeal because they are unavailable, or they lose their appeal because we just don't find them attractive. That's when we start thinking of something else. So Srila Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavad Gita, in the purport 3.36, 3.37, there he says, Prabhupada uses the word lust very generically in that section. It is not just that 3.36 to 43 in the Bhagavad Gita is talking about mm, lust. The word uses karma. But if we consider Arjuna's question, that is, Atakena prayukto yam papam charali purushana anishana pivarishnaya baladivani yojitana. What is it that impels people to wrongdoings? So, it is, now it is not just lust, lust of course very prominent force, but it's anger also, it's greed also, it's envy also. So there are many things which can make us do wrong. So Krishna uses the word lust generically over there and he say, and Prabhupada in the purport says that the soul is seeking pleasure for a long time. 
and after prolonged frustration in its pursuit of pleasure, the soul starts inquiring about something higher. So now in the womb, what has happened? In the womb, it is that the life has become unbearable for the child. So when, when the way we are existing, it seems pointless, it becomes unbearable. That is the time when we start thinking, what am I living for? What is life meant for? Is there something higher? And that's how the potentiality of the soul for spiritual inquiry or for, uh, for knowing about God, that becomes activated. So, in this case, it is unbearable pain. It is being crammed in the womb and suffering terribly in the womb and recognizing that there is nothing I can do about it. So, maybe there is some higher power, maybe that higher power can help me and it calls out. And now, it's now we could say that there are two different possibilities. One is, every soul has the potentiality for spirituality for knowing about God, but the soul has never consciously connected with God in its spiritual evolution, in its spiritual evolution. And the other is the soul has connected with God. That means somebody has practiced some spiritual life, has had some maybe born in some kind of religious family, been in some religious environment, environment where they had some exposure to God. Then Krishna says in the second case, Purva Bhyasena Tena Yiva Riyate Yava Shopisa One is spontaneously attracted to a transcendence. Mm. It's almost like an irresistible attraction that is there. So there is, we could say, sometimes circumstantial turning toward God and there is sometimes an innate turning toward God. Sometimes we turn toward God because of our circumstances and sometimes we turn to God in spite of our circumstances. So because of our circumstances means the circumstances are so frustrating, so agonizing that there is no shelter left. And then we turn toward God. And the other is, that this, so that's because of our circumstances, they are so terrible, we turn toward God. Now we turn toward God in spite of our circumstances means this could be meant, may explain, may meant differently, but this could have different meanings. But what I am saying here is that the circumstances are not forcing the person to turn toward God. It is that that soul who has practiced some spirituality already has some attraction. And because of that attraction, the soul turned towards God. And it is, you could say, that circumstantial devotion and there is intentional devotion. And that there is a hierarchy in general, circumstantial devotion, intentional devotion and then there is transcendental devotion. So transcendental devotion is when one is naturally attracted to the Lord, when full of love. Intentional means is there is some knowledge, there is some attraction and one works to develop it. So here it is primarily circumstantial uh, that if the soul turns towards God, it is circumstantial. The circumstance is unbearable. However, it's not just circumstantial because the soul is here also expressing specific knowledge about God. It's not just saying, oh God exists, oh God if you exist, uh, please help me. The soul is actually expressing specific knowledge about the three modes and how the Lord exists beyond the three modes, how the Lord who is transcendental descends to the world and, uh, and has avatars in this world. So it's all very specific knowledge. It's not just generic Mm, sense of spiritual sense of something spiritual exists. So this indicates the soul has practiced some kind of spirituality in his previous life. And that's how the soul has turned toward the Lord. And is praying over here, my dear Lord, you are transcendental, you are liberated and you can liberate me. In tomorrow's class, I'll discuss about various cases of how the soul turns from circumstantial towards intentional and ultimately transcendental. And then we will also discuss about how the this soul, the embryo, prays to God and apparently what is the result of those prayers?
uh, we will talk about that in the future sessions so to summarize i spoke today on broadly the theme of how can the soul know about god and <clears throat> i started by talking about how we all may learn many things but that's informational knowledge functional knowledge cannot just be learned the potentiality has to be there so for humans to learn language the potentiality is already there and then we learn it so prabhupada also says child parents can teach child to walk but the child has the capacity to walk has the capacity in the sense of latent potential so similarly the in every soul love for krishna is potentially present knowledge of krishna is potentially present and it's not exactly dormancy sometimes some things are not uh, accurately conveyed in translation that is just the nature of idiomatic usage of different languages so dormancy means everything is fully present it just needs to be activated whereas a uh, potent potentiality means it's present in seed but it needs to be developed so in the case of krishna prem or in the case of knowledge of god it is uh, the point is that we it's like a seed which is given to us and our heart is fertile and then the seed has to grow so it's something which is potential which has to be developed so then i discuss so is this potential is this pot if this potential is innate to the soul then why is it not manifest in animals so the essential difference between humans and animals is not just that say the human brain is a much more sophisticated instrument or in the human mind the impressions are of a different nature than the body than the than in animal mind but that the soul's consciousness itself is more evolved if we consider soul's consciousness to be like a energy coming out of it then it is a, it is light energy which enables the gyan indriyas the knowledge acquiring senses to perceive and then it is also like electrical energy which enables the karma indriyas the acting senses to function so this the soul the energy that is coming out from the soul the light and the electrical energy that is much more uh, developed evolved in a human body than in an animal body and it's like you may have a better much more sophisticated weapon to attack but it's heavier you need the strength also to operate it so it's a human in the human body it says prabhupada uses one of the verses the human soul the human soul says that in the soul is always transcendental but the soul in the human body has the capacity to say these things and then i talked about yes, even if we say the potential for the soul is there and that potential can be manifest because in the human body things are compatible but when does it manifest so it could be circumstantial basically uh, we don't think about god and higher reality as a question of why do we exist all living beings ask how do i exist how can i live not why do i live so that from this transition from how to why happens when the way we are living becomes either unfulfilling or unbearable that means i set some goals and i just can't achieve them and then i feel life is unbearable or whatever goals are presented before me i just don't find them appealing sure so at that time the soul starts inquiry so in this case for the child uh, it is situations have become so unbearable that the soul is turning towards god this is circumstantial devotion circumstantial devotion when it it is focused and directed becomes intentional devotion and then eventually it will become a transcendental devotion thank you very much hare krishna Yeah. I'm trying to understand this point of uh, the consciousness of a divine soul in human form versus animal form actually manifests different levels of what we call uh, being evolved or your earthly energy in the soul. Would this um, could this be Understood in terms of something like bhakti sukriti, that when one has performed some devotional practice, that he felt that he was more evolved. Because I, I'm, I'm just struggling. You know, we have the example. Of course, it is very exceptional, but it's there. But Bhagwan Ram takes a beer body, and due to 
two special concessions to keep you from learning everything. If you had to learn a special lesson, if yeah. you were going to be doesn't work for you, all here is which is handy. But it's still it's there. And as you pointed out, there is something about the contradiction here. And we borrow these many statements that the soul was in chain in that area. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, what exactly makes a soul more or less evolved? And we see Bharat Maharaj going into a animal body and yet remembering everything. So, are the souls in animal body necessarily less evolved? And if the soul is really unchanging, then what exactly changes when it's when it is less or more evolved? <laughs> Let's start with the specifics. Bharat Maharaj example. So there are different principles that apply in different contexts. Say for example, you have one rule that if somebody kills someone, then they should be punished for that. But then if somebody kills in self-defense, then they needn't be killed. If somebody kills to protect the country, then they will be rewarded. So killing is one activity, but the context is also important. And sometimes that's why every rule has to be contextualized. So in the case of Bharat Maharaj, we'll see that there are two distinct principles which are operational. One is that neha bhikramanashosti pratyavayomanikriti. That whatever spiritual credits one is acquired, they will never be lost. That is 240. And there is also 86. Yam yam va pismaran bhavam tijatyante kalevaram. That whatever we remember at the time of death, that will be attained. So now in the case of him, these two pulled in different directions. He was very spiritually evolved. The spiritual credits could not be lost. At the same time, he had become attached to a deer. Obsessively attached. So then he got a deer body, but he did not lose the spiritual orientation of the consciousness. So in some cases, exceptional cases, you know, the soul's consciousness can manifest uh, beyond the body's potential. That means, that's how most people, so that's the primary expression for paranormal abilities. There is telepathy. Uh, and there are well-documented cases of telepathy, there are well-documented cases of clairvoyance. Without opening up a people, opening an envelope, they know what is written in the letter. So, and we also understand that yogic siddhis are there. So, when the yogic siddhis are there, essentially what is happening? Like yesterday I discussed, the, for the soul, the mind, the body and the mind, or primarily the body you could say, it's not the generator of consciousness, it's the degenerator of consciousness. It's the, it's, it degrades the consciousness, to extent, limits it. Uh, but in some cases, that, that limiting may not happen. That, is, that soul can manifest more potential, more active, more capacities, more activities than what other souls in that body can. That's how yogic siddhis are there. So similarly, to the, uh, uh, although Jad Bhar, Jad Bharat Maharaj in a dear body, because of his previous spiritual credits, the attraction to Krishna which he had got, so he did not lose that. And that's how in a dear body also he was not like an ordinary dear. He was like a very spiritual here. So, yes, we could relate it with the Bhakti Sukruti. Um, that generally, now, I would be a little cautious about calling it necessarily specifically Bhakti Sukruti. It is more of uh, Adhyatmic Samskar, spiritual impressions. Because when, when Neha Vikraman Ashosti, Krishna talks about it, that what you achieve on this path is never lost. That is about general transcendence. It is not necessarily about bhakti. And even the section from 637 to 45, where Arjuna asks Krishna about the fate of the deviated yogi, Prabhupada says that anybody who is pursuing transcendence by whichever path, they are all on the auspicious path. In 640, Prabhupada says that, uh, So, Kalyana Krutu, anybody who is doing auspicious work, 
they will never meet with destruction krishna says and prabhupada writes in that purport that auspicious work means jnana yogi dashtang yogis bhakti yogis anybody who is pursuing anything higher than material reality so that's that attraction toward transcendence that is something which stays with the soul now it may or may not be manifest because the soul also has free will and because of that free will if the soul wants to misuse the free will then they may not actually engage in transcendence although they have that attraction to transcendence present within them so now so where exactly is the difference between a evolved soul and a less evolved soul <clears throat> as you know that the soul goes from one body to another with the mind so the mind is the constant cover around the soul and whatever the soul functions in the world it's through the channel of the mind so everything that we do creates impressions i recently gave a class that is devotion just like a good habit some people they say oh you chant and you feel peaceful you give a bad habits but somebody might do mindfulness and they might give a bad habits somebody might do some other meditation and they might give a bad habits so is chanting just like a good habit so is it that uh, we have formed negative impressions now we form positive impressions and then the negative impressions go away so yes devotion is like a good habit but it is more than a good habit also because what it is that see everything that we do it forms impressions every action forms impressions and that impression leads to propositions to do the same thing again if i do something i'm inclined to do it again and that's how people become say addicts but that's how healthy habits can also be cultivated mm, so devotion as we especially practice in sadhana bhakti it's also about giving ourselves a lot of good external perceptions which form impressions within us but krishna is intimately connected with the soul so what we could say is that devotion is an external impression that leads to the activation of an inner inclination so that is not the case with any other habit somebody might develop a habit of exercising now it's not that the soul has a habit of exercising per se it is you develop a habit that's external impression and that leads to that same thing happening again again but devotion is an external impression which leads to the activation of an inner inclination and the sadhana is for us to do the external impression again and again and again and again uh, sadhana is the effort the effort to give us the external impression again and again and the krupa is the activation of the inner inclination so the inner inclination that in the soul's potentiality in unleashed that is the result of mercy so that's why some people they just practice a little bhakti and they have enormous attraction to krishna and some people might do expose themselves a lot to devotional impressions but their attraction not awake so the krupa is also there but the element of mercy is grace is also very important over there so to summarize it together now that the difference is in terms of the soul itself is unchangeable but at a apart from a very strict analytical level huh, when the soul is in the material world differentiating between the soul and the subtle body is very difficult the soul's consciousness doesn't manifest any way anywhere except through the subtle subtle body it is it always manifests through the subtle body itself sometimes the soul can consciousness can can manifest without the gross body but will never manifest without the subtle body so uh, we could say that like earlier i gave the example that the light beam is brighter and the electrical current is stronger in the human body so that this light beam and electrical current we have no uh, no information about it independent of the subtle body we can only perceive it as it's experienced through the subtle body so in a sense it's integral so when the soul goes from one body to another body the soul goes, so that it's a soul and the mind which go together and it's, it's almost like a combined pack 
so when the when in, in Bharat Maharaj's case he went to a dear body it was the soul and the mind which went together and the mind already had devotional impressions so those devotional impressions continued on you want to see question yes, so to clarify one but you're saying that you did accept it If the, which the parents, one of them is spiritual, another is not, and they, they have a child, so does the consciousness of the parents also affect the child's capacity to perceive spiritual spirituality in the womb? Yes, because our whole principle of Garbhadhan Samskar and other things is that consciousness is very malleable. And now you could say it, it works it different. A causation is very, very difficult to determine. What we can see usually is correlation. So correlation means A and B happen together. Now they, whether A led to B or B led to A, or uh, just A and B are independent but they happen together, that is a little difficult to know. So what, what I mean by this is that sometimes Mm, neither mother nor father might be spiritual, but the child might be spiritual. Like happened in Prahlad's case. No, it was a, uh, Hiranikashi was certainly not spiritually minded. And Kayadu was also not exactly spiritually minded. She was submissive to Narad Muni. But that submission was primarily because of the general culture of submission to sages. Not that she was specially attracted to Vishnu. So we could say Prahlad's devotion manifested in spite of his parents. Mm. Now, uh, that means, in this case, if we want to, if we can at one level say Prahlad is a spiritual soul, is, is a pure soul, has come from the spiritual world. But if you wanted to continue this analysis, we could say that means, in this case, Prahlad is already a spiritually evolved soul and manifested through those parents and then the devotion manifests in spite of whatever was available or not available. So, it could be that the soul itself is evolved and the soul uh, manifests in, in the body uh, through, the, through the conception. But it could also be that the generally it is said that the consciousness of the uniting couple determines the consciousness of the soul that will soul that will at that time impregnate the egg and form a sperm, form a, form a embryo and everything. So if both of them are in good consciousness, spiritual consciousness, then at that time, the, it's more likely that the soul who is attracted is also a spiritually evolved soul. So in this case, we could say, if the parents are spiritually evolved, they, they are more likely to attract a spiritually evolved soul also. But then, this is all very subtle and gahana karma nogati. The way karma works is very complex. Now, Krishna says this was Gahana Karmanogati. We could put it as the workings are so workings of karma are so complex that they can even give complex thinkers a complex. 
<laughs> it's not something you understand. Sometimes the par- both the parents might be extremely spiritual, and still the the child from them might be just materialistic. So we could have any of the possibilities. So the parents are spiritual, the child is spiritual. The parents are non-spiritual, the child is spiritual. The parents are spiritual, the child is material. Now further, if you want to complicate it, now one one parent might be more spiritual. The second parent might be less spiritual. to be on a materialistic entire we don't know so basically we do what is in our control so what what is in our if we are spiritually minded then we try to provide as much spiritual impression as possible and we so when a soul comes in our care we we don't know what where where that soul has come from but what we can do and in wherever the soul has come from we can't change that also but what we can do is provide the best facility for the soul to spiritually evolve does that answer your question so okay Do you have some example of soul like development? Like if someone, someone, um, let's say that they have the soul of the spiritual realm, ultimately there is there is there are some higher options mm. in the spiritual realm. Okay. Does the soul, let's say the soul develops? while in the material existence going to higher and higher lands the soul also develop in the spiritual world ultimately for krishna everything is possible and the soul is the spiritual world is the world of love so if the soul has love for a particular manifestation of the lord and the lord will take him take that soul yad yad dhiya duruga ya vibhavayanti tat vapo pranyase sadanu grahaya that whatever whatever form the soul is attracted to the so consciousness is non gravitating towards the lord manifests in that particular form to show mercy to the devotee that's brahma ji's prayers of creative energy mm. having said that generally there is a, the spiritual world is characterized by eternal continuity and right? there are relationships which keep developing now there is an example of brihad bhagavata amrit where we describe the evolution of the gopakumara he goes to vaikuntha then he goes to ayodhya then he goes to kolonga so he goes to dwarka and then he comes back to the material world to vinda and then goes to vinda now sanatan goswami himself does not give any shastrik praman for this story that means that uh, whether this story is coming from any purana he doesn't mention that so there are within our tradition also different uh, different uh, devotees have different opinions about this that this story could of course be historical in terms of a, a gopakumar actually going through the whole journey like that it's possible but it's also indicative of how because the gaudiya vaishnava traditions at least in the in early years its stress was on establishing the supremacy of krishna and krishna prem and vrindavan so this story can be seen as a way by which uh, gopakumar by, by which gopakumar is gopakumar's experience is a means by which sanatan goswami shows the supremacy of uh, 
love for Krishna in Vrindavan. And even if that is not the case, even if it's a, even if we say that it's not non-historical, historical, but still we see that while the Gop Kumar is in Mathur, is in uh, Vaikuntha or in Ayodhya or in Dwarka, there all the Vaikuntha Vasis, for example, they believe that Vishnu is the ultimate reality, and they are fully devoted to Vishnu. And Sanatana Goswami does not give any asides over there. Actually, they are wrong. No? It's Krishna and Sukha. He doesn't say like that. Because in the matter of rasa, there is natural subjectivity. Rasa is an experience. So now, if we ask each of us, which food do you like? Which is your favorite food? Now, it's, food is a matter of personal experience, personal preference. So each of us may have a different taste for food. So... Uh, when the Vaikuntavasis consider Vishnu to be the be all and end all, that is not a deficiency. And that doesn't cause competition or insecurity. The Gokumar is not canvassing, oh, leave Vaikuntha Loka and come to, come to Goloka. Not like that. So everybody, wherever they are in the spiritual world, are, are eternally enriched with love for God. And they are satisfied in that. Now, for a special purpose, Krishna can, can do anything. But in general, the spiritual world, from what I've what we've seen is that whatever references I have read is that the growing in terms of developing relationship with a particular manifestation of divinity, focusing on a particular manifestation of divinity that happens in this world, and in the next world also, in the spiritual world, also growth can happen. But growth happens more in terms of a deeper and deeper. Uh, connectedness, greater and greater love for that manifestation. Whether it moves from this manifestation to that, I have not, apart from the Gop Kumar story, I don't really know many references for that. So thank you very much. Kvantra Shrimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhattabandha ki.